hello and welcome to part three. One thing I promised myself is that I wouldn't milk this topic, but after scrolling through comments for hours and after a certain lawsuit has come up, I figured I couldn't really get away from making another video. I was halfway through making this when I realized if I responded to the immense amount of comments when I'm talking about the lawsuit that the video might end up being way too long. I decided to commit the two. There'd be no organization if this were one video. People who only came for the lawsuit would cry clickbait, and I wanted to get the information out on the lawsuit as soon as possible before it gets stale. I'm only going to talk about the lawsuit, and the video after this will finally reply to all of you people with amazing points on the other two videos. I'll make the summary of the lawsuit as brief as I can without sacrificing too much detail. Well, maybe not this brief. So this video is going to glance over a lot of nuance like the last two did. If it didn't, it'd be an hour long, and I'd get it out by the time everyone has forgotten about APs and College Ward has gone all Ozymandias on us. So maybe I'll revisit this in the future to be more comprehensive after the lawsuit has reached a conclusion. First and foremost, I'm not sure if this is as big a problem as I think it is, but I want to get it out of the way. I don't like College Board. I hope I don't come across as making these videos just for malice or condescension's sake when I raise points against the hate I see online. So why would I say I'm defending them? I really don't like the blind, uneducated, pitchfork mob style hate especially when it comes across as completely ingenuine. That's subjective, and I suppose the better argument I'd make to all of the AP students out there is this. You can condemn defending a monopoly all you want, and shut down any internal debate, but when you actually get around to criticizing them for being so greedy, you know, when it's not blatantly obvious it was solely sparked by your AP tests not working, no one is going to take you seriously. Who's going to listen to the Zoomers that threw a fit and threatened a class action against a company for making a Reddit account? Well, I mean, that's not exactly the point I'm trying to make. People have a right to get upset about that, even if I disagree. But by that example, I mean to say our case doesn't really have a strong angle to begin with for the <laughs> above 18 crowd. It's really when we dogpile on College Board for all the wrong reasons that this becomes something akin to that old meme of boomers fabricating things to get mad at millennials about. Sure, the difference is that our motivations are noble, but when our tactics are unscrupulous and notoriously misguided, you can't disagree it becomes a lot easier for people to dismiss the real root of the problem as just another thing people are getting unreasonably upset about. Okay. Gonna move on before any more allegories start to creep in. So, yeah. College Board has been sued for its handling of the 2020 AP exams. Regardless of your stance, this case just by its very nature is extremely interesting. Can you sue a company for glitches that the plaintiff believes could have been preventable? How do you prove that in the 21st century? If they were, does the fact that they were thrown together in a month of quarantine in any way excuse that? Well, it might for some people, but in a court of law? Can you call 2020's exams gross negligence and a breach of contract? I mean, if you consider the rural, low-income, and international students, maybe. Well, anyway, I'm going to try and separate fact from opinion. So, here are the facts. Okay, I won't do that again. May 20th, 2020. A lawsuit was filed against College Board with claims including a breach of contract, gross negligence, misrepresentation, and violations of the Americans with Disabilities Act requiring $500 million in monetary relief, perhaps even more. It's not demanding monetary relief only. It's also requesting that College Board accepts test answers where students have proof they were completed by timestamp, photo, and email. College Board's official response to this? When the country shut down due to coronavirus, we surveyed AP students nationwide, and an overwhelming 91% reported a desire to take the AP exam at the end of the course, presumably online of course. Within weeks, we redesigned the AP exam so that they could be taken at home. Nearly 3 million AP exams have been taken over the first 7 days. Those students who are unable to successfully submit their exam can still take a makeup and have the opportunity to earn college credit. Now half of you- what? There's more? Oh, God. This lawsuit is a PR stunt masquerading as a legal complaint being manufactured by an opportunistic organization that prioritizes media coverage for itself. It is wrong factually and baseless legally. The College Board will vigorously and confidently defend against it and expect to prevail. Wow. The interim board director, Bob Schaefer of Fairtest, as far as I can tell, the spearheading organization suing College Board, claims that this wasn't their idea. 
Since I rattled off College Board's statement, I suppose it'd be fair to do theirs. College Board was warned about many potential access, technology, and security problems by Fairtest and other groups that had documented crashes when other computerized tests were introduced. Nevertheless, the board rushed untested AP computerized exams into the marketplace in order to preserve its largest revenue-generating program when they could no longer administer in-school tests. Another organization in the suit tells a similar story. The College Board administered the exam knowing ahead of time that students would encounter problems and now is retreating by blaming others and taking absolutely no responsibility, says Philip A. Baker, a partner with one of the two firms that filed the suit. That's the story so far, presented as impartially and as brief as I can. I used an array of news articles for most of the screenshots because they summarize in better words than I can, but just to be safe, I checked the actual lawsuit PDF on the Fairtest website to make sure nothing major slipped through the cracks. I'm also going to treat this PDF like the only justification for the lawsuit, because if I crawled Twitter, YouTube comments, and Reddit posts like last time, I just might go insane. Well, one exception to that. Before I give my take on the lawsuit in particular, this paragraph in an official news article really caught my eye. And the vast majority of the other articles about the suit pretty much just parrot this. First, though not everyone agrees, a large amount of AP students have accepted that going online was really the only way they could have delivered AP exams. And when I follow this screencap's train of logic, you know, presenting absolutely no alternative solution and all, I find it ridiculous that it seems to suggest I should get absolutely no opportunity to get AP credit after a year of hard work, functionally nullifying four of my classes just to make it fair for someone with a noisy family. I'm sure the people with noisy families and spotty internet would also agree that a 1% failure rate is better than a 100% cancellation. Now before you go typing in the comments, I fully concede that this is wholly fallacious for me to assume that these articles are implying AP exams should have just been cancelled. But that's not really the point. The point is that there is no other solution to address AP exams as a whole. It was online or no APs as far as I'm concerned. The only alternative solution I've seen to this is doing something similar to IB, basically using course grades, but this is unviable. I'll explain why in the next video. But really, people complaining about this aren't really offering up any alternative solutions. As for the second sentence, I've been seeing comments on my videos expressing similar concerns. This screenshot really expresses my thoughts on the matter. Pause and read if you want, but in short, throwing a fit that they are supposedly turning a blind eye to exam issues and then still complaining when they make attempts to rectify the situation going forward is, for lack of a better word, well, for lack of a nicer word, childish. I also want to talk about each company's statement. College Board has had a rather docile PR department, but this is the first time we get to see a head honcho speak unfiltered. Honestly, they could have left their response at the first paragraph, and people would have had a much harder time criticizing them, because it becomes undoubtedly easier to dismiss the genuine points they bring up when they show their true colors of being a defensive monopoly, finally facing a real threat outside of the whiny tweets they're used to. Fairtest and Collegeboard are pretty much a movie protagonist-antagonist pair. I'm gonna leave their defamatory claims about Fairtest behind because I can't really say whether that's true or not because, well, honestly, I haven't heard of Fairtest before this and it would be unpopular and baseless for me to take Collegeboard's word at face value. The rest of the statement is well-crafted, only really implying three major points of defense rather than the barking that the rest of it devolves into, completely opposing this lawsuit that seems to be clawing at every point against Collegeboard they can find. They're basically saying that most students signed up for this, they were under a hefty time constraint, but even I wouldn't say weeks. And people facing rare errors still get a chance to get what they paid for, college credit, because of the June retake. I think these claims are valid, but the first one is particularly troublesome when you start to talk about refunds. I'll get to that in a sec. Also, I lied. I'm not going to talk about the other two statements because the claims are either too broad and unprovable or I ended up talking about them when I went through the lawsuit PDF. I could structure this like a well thought out video essay, but now that I'm fully entrenched in the opinion zone, I'm just going to go down this lawsuit PDF point by point pretty much. My initial impressions are that Fairtest doesn't really present this suit very fairly. <laughs> I don't really expect them to though because it would be hypocritical of me to not expect a monopoly to give immediate refunds en masse while expecting a plaintiff to be entirely impartial. The introduction focuses on how profitable the AP exams are and how overbearing College Board is in the modern education system. These are true, don't get me wrong, but this isn't really the point. I feel like I'm repeating myself, but yes, College Board is a monopoly, but putting all of our cards on the table of a sinking ship is only going to get them wet. 
I apologize for the confusing double metaphor, but I hope you get the idea. Knowing your case is weak enough that you have to try and evoke mob sympathy isn't a good sign. Anyway, let's take a bit of a detour. A lot of people, including myself, have thought that College Board isn't giving refunds at one point. This isn't actually the case, and even the lawsuit knows this. I feel a bit apprehensive approaching this topic because I feel like there's something major I'm glossing over. Many people seem to operate under the assumption that just in general what College Board is doing regarding refunds as a whole is completely immoral. But I don't know about other schools, but I pay my high school to buy the exams from College Board, so they are giving refunds, but you know, back to the actual buyers. I can't say the process of getting a refund is going to be 100% seamless for everyone, but I genuinely don't see a reason why it wouldn't. If you disagree, let me know in the comments. Points 5 and 6 really drive home what was hinted at earlier. The idea that College Board is at fault for not listening to the many warnings about the ramifications of online exams. Well here I'm not going to completely dismiss this because that'd be just a bit foolish. Again, repeating myself, it was this or no exams. I figure this is really just trying to strengthen that point about negligence, which is why it's framed in such a specific way. I do think though that it would have been relatively painless to offer a direct and immediate refund system for students without technology. To my knowledge, they didn't do this. Sure, they might get backlash for not extending that system to students in general, but come on, I feel like those people are actually deserving of an expedient refund. I was a bit harsh in part 2, so I again want to clarify I'm not grouping the incompetence contributing to user error with people who don't have access to technology. Those less fortunate people were wronged by College Board in this case. Point 7. Did they really not think that this at the very least sounds misleading? I thought multiplying the percentage by the total amount of test takers to get a more threatening number was arguably misleading though understandable, but saying measurable failure rate is just... Well, it's technically true, but I don't feel like I need to explain why this is bad. Point 8 is actually where I feel the lawsuit is the strongest. Again, taking the screenshot by itself, I don't see how College Board said they would expect to prevail. I feel like I was in danger of just becoming known for defending College Board blindly all the time, but this paragraph is just solid. They didn't really bring up refunds and stuck to the point that some students just weren't able to take the exams. Now, you might be crying hypocrisy with my stance on glitches in the AP exams being different, but glitches are relatively out of College Board's control, and those students still have access to the June retake, so it's not like they're unable to take the exams altogether, like these students. Still, I can't really take a decisive stance. I feel like the statement, it was this or no APs, holds some weight here, and I don't really know what College Board could have done for these students, and it seems the lawsuit doesn't know either. I'm going to blow through the rest of the suit mostly because there are about 40 pages, and me scrolling through a law document and rambling is probably starting to bore people. Quote, nor did it offer any remedies to those who experienced glitches. What? You don't recall the email solution, the troubleshooting tips, the June makeup? I mean, hey, even the AP demo was meant to address this in some way. And if those don't classify as remedies, your definition of remedies is unreasonable, considering we're talking about the finicky and opaque nature of computer glitches. Also, was anyone surprised someone's helicopter mom got involved and resorted to the way. of just suing the corporation so their child doesn't have to do the June retake? Oh, wait, I almost forgot about that, because it doesn't really seem to be a major point in this lawsuit despite the news articles. Quite honestly, I think it definitely helped the case if that point was dropped. Anyway, I mean, as an aside, does anyone know what this even means? I quoted it verbatim earlier in the video, and just about every other article did a similar kind of sidestepping of analyzing this quote. But it really just seems like a vague catch-all with little merit. Semantics aside, in general, people want to prove they completed the exam on time and force College Board to manually review every single person's case out of those who had trouble submitting. I mean, first of all, there were 3 million exams administered this year. Going off of the extreme allegations against College Board, they would have to review nearly a million individual reports. But I can't imagine that number in actuality is trivial, even considering the official statistics they released. Second, this swings the door wide open for fraudulent claims by people who didn't really have trouble submitting and people who went back to check their work after the exam, completely fracturing this equity Fairtest seems to hold to a gold standard. I mean, look. College Board did a lot to prevent cheating, but they couldn't really stop people from distributing exam questions. 
As an anecdote, one of my close friends was flirting with the idea of sending the exam questions to a teacher right after the exam, but ultimately decided it wasn't worth the risk. What I'm saying is that people have had time to fake their answers, and that's not the only issue. It's laughably easy to fake proof. I can't help but feel like the distress of having to do the June retake is clouding many people's judgments to the point where they're practically begging College Board to treat a picture of them holding their answers next to the countdown screen as completely unfakeable. Okay, wow, I'm glad I decided to split this into two videos. Um, thanks for watching, I promise I'll get to the comments soon, and even if I just comment thanks or if I just heart your positive comment, it's really underplaying the sheer amount of joy that comments like that bring me. Thank you.